The dirt road that leads to my house is seven-tenths of a mile in from the paved road. One has no idea what you're going to see when you come to the end of this path. So I'm going to take you inside as I would for a person who has never been here before. And off to the left, we pass a little tool shed. It's a charming little structure. It's designed to match the house. And here's what the house looks like from the path. And now we're going towards the water and you still have no idea of the magnificent vista that awaits you at the far end. What I usually do is blindfold someone until they reach the eclipse edge. And of course, they have their hands on my shoulders, so I lead them in. We're going first to pass my bedroom off to the right. It has a sliding glass door. And I'm going to turn the camera towards the door so that you get an idea of where it is. Eventually, we'll go into the house and I'll photograph all the rooms. And the next room we come to off to the right is my studio with the steps leading in and another sliding glass door. And as you see, everything is glass. And now the vista is opening up in all its splendor. And we've seen this before on part one of my movie. And each day, of course, each hour, it's different. That's the cathedral living room where one eats. And I want to show you a little bit of the grounds around my house. Do you notice how beautifully it's weed whacked? Now, you know, weed whacking is a very strenuous occupation, but it's curious. I love to do it because I get the satisfaction of changing chaos into order and dissonance into harmony, very much like when I work on a technical or musical problem and clarify it. So now I'm going to take you along the northeast side of the property where there is a surprise awaiting you. And we're going to turn back and there's my bedroom. And we just have a glimpse of the northeast side of the house. It's a wonderful construction. And now we're going to continue towards the northeast side of the border of my property. It's not a very large property, but it certainly is large enough for me. So we have to go through a lot of entanglements here but it's worth it because of the surprise that awaits us at the far end. Get the branches out of my face and maneuver around the trees and we're coming to the edge of the cliff here, which is a totally different view as you see. And now here comes the surprise. That island in the middle of John's Bay is called Tunney's Island. Gene Tunney was the retired heavyweight champion of the world. And by the way, his son was a senator. And many years ago, President Kennedy went on to the island for a vacation. And after all, presidents have to be in touch with the whole world but unfortunately, Gene Tunney didn't have a telephone. And so they laid a cable underneath John's Bay all the way to the island so that the president could be in touch with the whole world. There were magnificent yachts that used to visit Tunney's Island. Well, they don't travel these waters anymore. I suppose the economic situation has dampened that possibility. 
And so off to the right is the familiar vista that you saw in part one, and you recognize the thread of life in the Atlantic Ocean and the waves ever crashing on the rocks. I have a long association with raccoons. As a matter of fact, I never saw a raccoon until I moved to Maine around 45 years ago, and the first raccoon I ever saw was this one. I left her a piece of Betty Crocker cake outside my studio door, and she finished the cake and walked up the steps and looked at me very pleadingly. So naturally, I call her Betty. And as a matter of fact, I made a book about Betty as I did Belinda the Chipmunk. And like Belinda, it comprises photographs, music, and stories. Each summer, occasionally, a raccoon from a previous summer returns, or the children of that raccoon come and they, of course, remember me. And this summer, a charming raccoon appeared. I called him Andrew. But there was a little problem. One day, Andrew brought me two babies, so from that moment on, her name now is Andrea. And here is Andrea coming up the steps of my studio to have a cookie. So I slide open the screen, let in the mosquitoes, of course. And here comes Andrea up the steps. She's a little timid about the camera, you know. She usually takes it even more gently than that but I think the camera frightened her. And naturally, one cookie isn't enough for a mother who's taking care of two children. So she comes up again for a second treat, and she's so adorable. Every night, Andrea comes up to the window and greets me she would really love to be in close contact with me, but I don't open the door. But now I'm going to give her another cookie, and she's getting used to the camera now. And you will see how gently she takes the cookie now. Much more gentle than before. See how sweet? Is that adorable? Can't get over it. She said, come on, sweetheart, look, take the cookie, puppy. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, how adorable. Just so sweet. And now I throw out some kibble so that her children can eat. The light isn't so good outside, so I decided to take a flash shot of Andrea and her two children. You notice they're eating kibble, and kibble, after all, is very healthy, much better for them than the cookies. I expect next year that either Andrea and the two children, or just the two children, who will be all grown up, will come up the steps and pay their respects to me, and probably bring their own children. The raccoon family will go on forever, like the sea. In part one, you have seen magical views from the cliff's edge and around my property. But there is a magic all its own within my home as well. Before I share it with you, we have first to return to the path 
I took you on in part one. The beginning of the path will be familiar to you. You remember the tool shed off to the left. But instead of going straight ahead, we're going to veer off to the right. You see the entire home, a bird's eye view of it. By the way, that white object to the right of the house on the ground is my generator. It is a marvelous invention because the electricity goes off very often in Maine. There is a gully along the right side of the house that actually leads down to the rocks. And the trees are very healthy around the property and growing very tall. reaching towards the sky, as they say. Now that structure straight ahead is not part of my house. In order to make all of this economically feasible, I went into partnership with my friend Thomas Darson, a marvelous pianist. The original structure was a cathedral ceiling living room with an adjacent kitchen plus two studios with bathrooms. And now here is the entrance to my extension. We both built on the extensions around 10 years ago. We're coming into the kitchen. And to the left is a utility closet that houses the hot water tank and too many things to enumerate. And now you'll see the right wall of the hall that was the original outside of the house. You see the extension was built onto it and the fuse box is lined, the cover is lined with handmade Japanese paper. This is an instrument from Indonesia called an angklung. It rattles and produces a pitch. And there is a wooden horse that I found in an antique shop when I first moved into the house. There are lots of paintings in the house. This one is unnamed and I like it very much. It's a little village in Europe somewhere. And to the left, is a painting by my late friend Erna Friedlander. I call her the pancake lady because her hair looks like two pancakes hanging down, but she has a real personality. And there you see all the appliances, so much of which I don't have in New York City. And lots of cabinet space and always light pouring into all the rooms. And there is the refrigerator and the sink, more cabinets. And skylights, which are so valuable for emitting fresh air, and they also serve as an exhaust for smoke that may accumulate. When I moved to Maine, a stained glass artist gave me a small framed nature scene made of stained glass. I was delighted to have it, and I mounted it way up near the ceiling between my kitchen and the hallway that leads to my bedroom. On the first morning that I awakened in Maine, Many years ago, I rather staggered into the kitchen and I looked up and there the stained glass was illuminated. At first I thought that I had left the light on in the hall all night, but as I looked further, I realized that the sunlight 
coming through the glass in the hall and through the sliding glass door in my bedroom was illuminating that stained glass. It looked simply beautiful. And now we're coming to a hallway, and there you see a Japanese scroll called a kakamono. I bought it for $10 when I was a soldier in Korea. And above, you'll see a light fixture that hung in my mother's home. When my mother passed away, I inherited everything in her apartment. Up there on the wall is a death mask, B.C., a death mask from Peru, and it has the original hair of the deceased person, rather spooky. And there is a strap that hung around a bullock in Peru. I like the design very much. Now we're going to come to my bathroom. Notice the light pouring from above. And there it is. Those windows radiate light. And that chandelier, by the way, was a present from my niece. There is the stall shower that works like a dream. And there is an antique medicine chest that seems to fit so perfectly into this rustic environment. There I am in the mirror, photographing the place. And off to the left is a drawing of angels that my late friend Helen Thomas had reproduced for me. And here is one of my treasures. It's a Chinese embroidery of a nature scene. I find it simply wondrous to look at. And there are the windows again. In part three, there will be a surprise as we actually drop down into my bedroom.